Welcome everybody to top 10 tips for successfully buying and selling homes with solar. I'm so excited to share this with you. Thank you for taking your time to think about our planet and all the things that we can do to make it better and to care for it together. So thank you for being here today. Before I dive into the content, I just want to let you know that I have a series of workshops. And so this starts in May and every week there will be a new session of this four different series. So 101 and 102 are the solar basics, how to buy and sell homes with solar, and then 102, electrify everything, the coming revolution. So those are really just the basics. And then if you want to know about how to grow your business with solar, that's what 201 and 202 are all about. We also have other events that happen regularly, weekly at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. We have Power Hour on the third Saturday. We have Power Day. And then on the fourth Sunday, I do Solar Sundays with Joan. So I would love to see you on any of those. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. A little bit about me. My name is Joan Gregerson. I'm the CEO of my business, Climate Action Homes. I'm also an independent solar consultant with Power. We are a certified B Corp and the fastest growing solar company in the US. And I'm on a mission to help people make a positive eco impact with their homes. So a lot of background doing building energy engineering, sustainability, solar, wrote a book, helped some nonprofits get going and former realtor as well as mom and grandma and now back here in Denver, Colorado. What we're going to talk about today is the top 10 tips for successfully buying and selling homes with solar. And I want you to know these are just the tips. There's a lot to it. And as I was putting this together, I was thinking, oh, I should add this. Oh, I should make it shorter. And I realized this is really to just get you started. And when you are in real life with a solar project, that's when you want to reach out to your solar partner. So you're not meant to memorize all this or know all this off the top of your head. This is solar 101, just really getting you started. All right. So number one tip, we're just going to go right to this. Solar has had a bad reputation with real estate agents. In fact, one of my best friends was telling me, I hate solar. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, she's a real estate agent. And it made me so sad. But the thing is that I know a lot of agents have experienced a lot of problems with solar, the common ones that we've heard. Liens that need to be paid off, solar companies that go out of business, it can't be reached. You've got a buyer that says, oh, this is the perfect house, except I don't like solar. <laughs> different contract types, system sizes, the payments, uncertainty about the, the condition or the production of the solar system, not sure if it's a good value for the buyer, difficulty determining the value of the solar. Yeah, solar systems definitely do add complexity. All of that is true. And so for a lot of people, what solar means for a lot of agents is hassles, frustrations, delay, confusion. You're concerned about your client being upset or maybe even risking losing the deal. But what I want to tell you is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, sadly, a lot of those things happen more so in the past than now, but there's a lot of value to solar and it's just like, okay, that little, that phone on the left, not a lot went wrong with it. <laughs> and when we first got cell phones, there was a lot of frustrations, but we can do so many different things now. We're not going to go back to that phone on the wall. And same with like LED lights. So LED lights, they last 25 times longer. They use a quarter of the energy, but the first LED lights had some high failure rates but we're not gonna go back to incandescence. We're gonna get that worked out. And like, I have a friend right now, she's in Korea, she's traveling around and she's been able to send us photos, pictures of herself and all this stuff by email and through her blog. And it's nice to be able to have those letter keepsakes, but we're not gonna go back. We're not gonna say, okay, no more email. And so it's the same with solar. 
is that even though you may have had some struggles in the past, solar is here to say to stay. And so now it's time to befriend solar. And that's what I'm going to help you with. Tip number two is your clients are going to go solar with or without you. So this picture right here, where do you think this is? A lot of people might think California, but actually this is in Denver, Colorado. One of the neighborhoods here just decided to make solar available for every new home. And so almost every single one of them does have solar. So no matter where you are, solar is coming and it's coming big. Here's something from Grandview Research saying that the market size in 2023 for solar is 17 billion. That's expected to almost triple by 2030. That's huge, right? This solar data cheat sheet from the Solar Energy Industry Association has so many amazing statistics on here. Like the price of solar has declined by 53% in the last 10 years. That solar accounted for 50% of new generating capacity and 24% annual growth over the past 10 years. And this one, 15% of US homes will have a solar PV system by 2030. When, when they ask people directly, what about you? What are you thinking about solar? You can see almost half said, I don't have solar panels right now, but I plan to install them sometime in the future. So that means half of your clients are thinking about going solar or wanting a home with solar. 60% said that they're concerned about their home's impact on the environment. You as a real estate agent, do you shy away from talking about the environment? when 60% of your clients are concerned about it, there, this is a missed opportunity that you can seize on. And the 75% said it's important for them to switch within the next five years. And their hesitation is upfront costs. But the thing is now that most solar companies like ours, like Power, we have zero down financing. So no money required upfront. And the monthly bill is often similar to or less than the current utility bill. So it's a bill swap. They're already paying for electricity. They're basically renting their power. And with the zero down financing, they can be buying it for something similar. So how big is this opportunity? Of the 130 million homes in the US, about 90 million are eligible for solar and only 4 million have gone solar. So that leaves 86 million eligible households to go solar. Why are homeowners going solar now? In a survey by the Pew Research Center in October 2022, here are the top reasons that they said, you save money on utility bills, help the environment. Again, look at that. 81% are saying that they would go solar to help the environment. Solar tax credit, better for my own and my family's health. We're seeing additional reasons too, though. People wanting to future-proof their homes, add value, cities and states that are starting to require it, outage protection, and controlling their electricity costs. I know a lot of people focus on California and Hawaii and places that have higher electricity rates, but throughout the country, people are seeing higher electricity bills. Is wild what just happened here in the Denver, Colorado area with Excel in it. These massive rate increases. And at the same time, they had record profits. And it's that kind of feeling that people are like, oh, what, what can I do? And so most people have been wanting to go solar for a while or finding a home with solar. This is just one more thing that's pushing people over the edge especially as folks are getting these new time of use rates in where the on peak rates can be a couple times higher, two and a half times higher than their off peak. They're just feeling a lot of being out of control and wanting that independence. And I think another thing that a lot of real estate agents don't really understand is just how real the savings is with solar. This is a before and after solar bill from somebody in Colorado. And you can see all this stuff added up to $170 for one month of their electricity usage. After solar, 
And this isn't always the case, but in this case, they had a month where they had no electricity used from the electric company. And so all they paid was their fixed charges. So they're paying $6 instead of 172. And that is the value that people are seeing. It's freeing up, like in this case, 160 some dollars that they could be using to buy their own electricity. Um, another thing that people mentioned there was the new incentives that are out. The Inflation Reduction Act increased the federal tax credit to 30%. And so this is great. The federal government is now helping you buy your solar, paying 30% of that cost. And what does that actually mean? Here's an example where the initial price was $32,000, but then once the tax credit would be applied. So if somebody applies and gets that back, their net cost would be $23,000. That is real money in an investment in their own home. Plus, we're also seeing this move to electrify everything. And that's what my Solar 102 course is about. You've got cities in Colorado and around the country that are pushing people to go all electric so that they can get off gas. And the more that they do that, being able to power that with, with solar on their roof means that they can have this net zero energy home that a lot of us have dreamed of from a very young age. Wouldn't it be cool to be independent in that way? So it's getting to that point where people can put those solar panels on their roof and provide that electricity themselves. Tip number three, this is so important. Look at this beautiful planet that we get to live on. Now, this is a picture of the Earthrise 1968 when the Apollo 8 astronauts were orbiting the moon and they came over and saw, wow, out in this darkness where everything just seemed dead, that there was this one blue shining spot that is planet Earth, this place where life is just thriving. This is the picture of the blue marble, again, taken by NASA astronauts. This is the first time that, I think it was 1973, where we here in planet Earth were able to see what Earth looks like as a whole, just out in the middle of space. And I invite you to take a few deep breaths and really soak into this to get past a lot of times we get so nitpicky on some of the details but this is the real thing you guys we are blessed we won the lottery we're on planet earth this is something i think it's really important whether you're a real estate agent or a solar consultant or somebody looking at buying a home when we're talking about our future this right here is this is home sweet home this is our main home when people are talking about climate change and the extra carbon dioxide that's being put into the atmosphere, I've heard some people say we can't just treat our atmosphere like a sewer system and just drop, dump carbon dioxide. From this view, it looks like, wow, it's just infinite. Like, why would it matter? But actually, our atmosphere is this teeny tiny little layer. So how thick do you think that the atmosphere actually is? The diameter of planet Earth is about 8,000 miles wide. But our atmosphere is just this teeny tiny layer, this fragile layer. It's 60 miles thick. So if somehow you could get in your car and just drive straight up, an hour from now, you would be out of this protective shell that is keeping all of, or all of life available to us here on planet Earth. And that is why taking care of our climate, taking care of our atmosphere is so important. Another way to think about it, the same ratio is if you had a basketball and you just wrapped it with a little piece of saran wrap or coated it with a coating of paint, that is how thin our atmosphere is. And that is why it's so important that we protect it. But we really haven't been so far. This is from NASA, Earth's global average surface temperature in 2020. 
is tied with 2016 as the hottest year on record, continuing a long-term warming trend due to human activities. Another way to understand this is to use the scientific visualization studio. So what you're gonna see in a second is how the temperature has changed from 1880 to 2021. If the temperatures are higher than normal, they'll show in red, lower than normal, they'll show in blue. So there's about the midpoint. I'm gonna play that one more time. And if you're with me live and you wanna put in what your birth year was, feel free, minus 1960. And then just keep an eye on what was the temperature, what changed, what was it like when you see your birth year come through? Okay, there's me, there's Sage. <laughs> it's hard for us to see this on a year by year basis, but when we can see the data like that, it's, it's a way for us to really understand what has actually been happening. In March, 2023, the IPCC, the panel that studies climate, this is the title of their posting, Urgent Climate Action Can Secure a Livable Future for All. That's amazing, right? That's saying if we don't do it, we can't secure a livable future. We're already seeing the impacts of climate change right now, of global warming. The World Resources Institute took that 8,000 page report and they summarize some of the key points, and that's what I'm going to share with you here. But things like ocean acidification at the highest level of the last 26,000 years, any one of these things, last decade warmer than any period for 125,000 years, any one of these would be pretty startling, but to see them all happening and the feedback I mean, this is what the scientists are saying. And so they're saying, okay, urgent climate action. So what should we do to create a livable future? Well, if you look at these top 10 solutions that were identified, check out the top three, retire coal plants, invest in clean energy and efficiency and retrofit and decarbonize buildings. When we go solar, when your clients as agents, when you're helping them buy a home with solar or get the value that they put in by investing in solar, you are taking on those first three solutions. Tip number three is that getting off fossil fuels is vital to a livable future. A lot of times people think of, okay, it's the status quo or going solar. But when we're choosing the status quo, this is what we're choosing. About 60%, say here in Colorado, of our electricity comes from coal or natural gas. So it's okay with me if you go extract that from somewhere, dig it up, frack, whatever you need to do, and then transport it cross country in trains. We see coal trains going by here every day, sending it to the plant where it's processed. A lot of water is used, a lot of moving parts where you generate electricity and then ship that back out over this aging infrastructure that is the electric grid. But the fun fact is that in the single hour, the amount of power from the sun that strikes the earth is more than we consume in a year. And think how different that is, that the sunshine is just raining down on us wherever we are, just like rain, like water. And when it hits one of these panels, photovoltaic, it produces this voltage that we can then use to power our homes. And so it's a pretty amazing thing that the entire solar system has no moving parts and we're not having to go dig up coal or anything. We're not transporting it cross country. Once we have that solar system in place, it just continues to, to generate electricity. As an agent, if you're not talking to your clients about climate change, you're missing a very important thing that they're thinking about. 65% of Americans are concerned about climate change, but most Americans think other people really aren't. They think only 43% are, so we're misrepresenting how concerned people are. This shows by generation. You can see that for every generation, at least 50% are either alarmed or concerned, that's huge, right? And so avoiding this topic is at our peril on every level. So tip number three is getting off fossil fuels is vital to creating a livable future. 
and going solar is one way to do that. All right, so tip number four, now we're gonna dive into the solar contracts. I think the biggest way that you can divide them just to start with is the contracts that are for somebody that's owning their solar. So that is somebody that has a cash purchase or a loan or non-owned. We also call that third-party owned. Sometimes you'll hear a TPO, a lease or a power purchase. And each of them have their pros and cons. As for me, I've worked at four or five different solar companies now. I've seen lots of different models and the best way to go solar is any way you can. And so if you're working with a seller or a buyer and they're looking at solar, just because it's a loan or a lease doesn't necessarily mean it's better or worse. But there are some pros and cons to it. So ownership, you're able to uh, get that 30% tax credit after you pay off your loan. You can generate electricity for free. It does add equity. If you do have a loan, you may be able to transfer that to a new owner. You do have to make sure that it's covered under your homeowner's insurance. And uh, some companies offer shorter warranties for own systems with power. That's not a case. We have a 30-year warranty for everyone. And for the lease systems, the pros are that for somebody who can't take the 30% federal tax credit, this might be a more advantageous financial situation for them. It does include insurance and maintenance. We often have lease buyout clauses. When I was at Sunrun, it was set up, you could buy it out at year five when the house was sold at the end of the contract. You have somebody that might be trying to buy some other stuff if you go with the lease, it doesn't impact your debt to income ratio. So in some cases that could be important for them, but it's not an owned asset. So it's not going to add to your home equity and yeah, you can't benefit from that 30% tax credit. And also people have had issues with a solar company that went out of business and it was a hassle trying to get that lease converted over. But what I would say is eventually it does get fixed. And so we're going to talk more about that in a minute if you have that problem with an orphaned system. The power purchase agreement is generally based on the amount of electricity you use at some fixed rate. So your bill will vary depending on how much you use. And it's very similar to, to lease in a lot of those pros and cons. Another important thing to understand is this UCC1 lien. Sometimes in the past, especially in California, there was a hero loan, a PACE loan, which this lien attached to the house itself. So if someone stopped paying on solar, that could prevent them from refinancing. It was a much bigger deal. But now what's common is this UCC1 lien. And this could be for a finance system if the loan hasn't been paid off or a lease system. It's what you'd think of as a mechanics lien. It can be lifted for refinance, but it does need to be paid off at the time of the home sale. Um, another really important thing to think about is transferring warranties. There always are warranties on the panels. There could be other equipment warranties that are still valid and the solar company could have warranties that sit on top of that. So when you're helping somebody, it's really important to make sure that warranty transfer is part of the whole process. So what happens if you have a system where it's been orphaned? The original installer went out of business. You just have to remind yourself that any issue that you're having, other people have already had it and there is a way through it. This place that I'm staying right now their company went out of business and I'm working with one of the installers that I know to help them adopt the system. And what that means is that the installer on record will be updated to a company that's now working that can set up the monitoring, can perform any of the maintenance under existing warranties. When this stuff that we just went through with all the solar contracting don't go it alone. One of the things that I always heard when I was in real estate was don't try to be the expert on all this stuff. Be the source of the source. So you refer people to experts. Similar to if somebody has a swimming pool or a well or a septic system, you as the agent, you don't want to be the expert on that. You want to say, oh, 
we should probably have somebody come and evaluate that or we should get somebody to help us and so that's why you want to reach out to your solar partner have somebody that you can be talking to when you have a home like that so tip number four was how to decipher your solar contracts tip number five is assemble your team when you have a home with solar a lot of those problems that we saw was that nobody mentioned it until the very end and different people needed to do things differently because the solar was on there, but because nobody brought it up, they get caught off guard at the very end. For example, the listing agent needs to let their team know for the marketing, for the contracts, the title company needs to check and see who is on record having the lien for that, or is there one? the solar installer to initiate the transfer, your solar partner, if you're a buyer's agent, to make sure that they really understand the key contract requirements, and the lender to make sure that it's accounted for properly. In Colorado, there are some specific clauses that were just added recently in 2022 that have to do with the solar system. So wherever you are, there may be something specific that you really need to know about based on that. And so I'm going to play this little couple minutes here. But most importantly here in both of these boxes under paragraph 10.6, for either one, there is a statement that says the buyer will, it's a checkbox, will or will not assume the seller's obligation either under the financing instrument or under the lease. Now, this is pretty important to be paying attention to, and it's important whether you're on the buyer side representing the buyer or the seller side representing the seller. If you're representing a buyer and you're writing an offer on their behalf, you're going to need to understand or hopefully understand a little bit more related to what sort of encumbrances are in place, right? How much money is left on that financing? It, there could be fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars remaining in financing. And so you're probably, if you don't have additional information at the point of, as a buyer's agent, of writing an offer on behalf of a buyer, in both of those, docu in both of those sections, you're going to be checking the box, will not, because you don't want your buyer to commit at the time of the offer to assuming the outstanding obligations that a seller has to a solar company, either under a lease or under a financing agreement. So you're probably going to be checking the boxes or you should be checking the boxes will not unless you know more at the time that you're writing the offer. Similarly, if you're a listing broker representing a seller and you're receiving an offer from a buyer, you need to be paying attention to those two sections if there's solar or other items, water softening systems, security systems, any of those other kind of things involved to make sure that whatever the buyer is writing in the offer is consistent with your seller's expectations regarding who's going to pay for this. Because Let's assume that it is an encumbered item and the seller and the buyer, I'm sorry, has checked the box, will not assume those obligations. What does that mean? It means that the seller, is, if they sign that contract, is going to be expected to essentially pay off whatever remaining financing obligation that they have at the time of closing, presumably out of the settlement proceeds. If the seller's expectations were different than that, they're going to be awfully ticked at you as their listing broker for allowing them or essentially committing them to allow the buyer not to pay those things off. All right, and so you got to be paying attention on the buy side to those two sections, as well as now uh, the, the listing side, because there's an affirmative commitment in there one way or the other. The hope with this change is that the discussion related to the solar panels, how they're currently owned, if at all by the seller, whether they're financed, leased, or owned outright, that that discussion gets backed way up in the transaction to the time of contract rather than what we have seen over the years, and I've heard this on the hotline, I still get calls occasionally from either a listing broker or a buyer's agent who's supposed to close on a transaction in the, you know, a week or two. They're well under contract, they're through their due diligence, and they call and they say, well, we just found out that the seller doesn't actually own the solar panels. And my response is, how could that not have been something that was discussed much, much earlier in the transaction? With these contract changes, it's gonna kind of force I believe, I hope, an earlier discussion on this. If you're a listing broker and there's solar panels on the roof, when you're going to your listing appointment to have your seller client sign the listing agreement, this needs to be part of that discussion, or maybe even earlier. Do you own them? Do you lease them? 
Are you financing in them some way? Can we get these documents, those documents from you? Can we get those uploaded to the MLS? Can we maybe put some indication in the MLS with regard to what the seller's expectations are of a buyer who's going to be writing an offer? Do they expect the buyer to have reviewed those documents beforehand? And are they expecting them to commit in paragraph 10.6.12 or 10.6.13? Are they going to be expecting that the buyer commits at the time of contract that they will assume those obligations? If those are the expectations, you got to get those documents in front of the buyer much earlier than what I think our markets have historically done. That right there, that was the legal counsel for the Colorado Association of Realtors talking about the specific contract clauses that are new. So wherever it is that you're doing your real estate, you maybe want to reach out to your state broker or your mentor and ask, hey, this has a solar system. How is this different? Because you definitely don't want to get caught at the very end. That leads into this document everything early and as soon as possible, as he was just saying, as part of the listing appointment. So get the contact information for the solar installer. Is that company still in business? Get the original solar system contract. Is it a loan? Is it a lease? Are there documents there? Is there a performance report that you can get from an app or from the installer? Recent electricity bills, electricity usage showing before and after, any kind of annual summary report. Some companies will have a true up report, warranty information, photos of key components. And if you're missing any of this, then you can have a solar inspection performed. So that's having a solar installer come out and do a review of that just the, as I was saying, the same way you would have somebody inspect a septic system. And you want to really share that documentation widely. All those documents that you got together, you want to make sure that you get those to your assistant, anyone on your team, get that entered into the MLS in the property description, any specific green feature fields, and maybe just upload the entire files there. The title company, have those ready for the open house, for the buyer's agent, for the lender, and for marketing. You want to be able to share the good news about solar. In one of her trainings, Marisa Fletcher talked about how they got a lease and it was $160 compared to, it used to be $300 in their low months and $600 in their high months. People might think, well, a lease is not really worth it. You as the agent need to be able to look at that information and put that in the marketing information. And again, if you're not sure how to do that, then you can reach out to your solar partner who can help you with that. And then when you're doing an open house, have those photos, have the overhead view of the home, because a lot of times people can't even see the solar, right? Have the solar app there so they can see the production in real time the warranties, the before and after, and the green energy efficiency building addendum or any analysis of the value. Then be able to get an accurate appraisal. Who here has ever even heard of this residential green and energy efficient building addendum? I was in a class with a dozen realtors a couple of weeks ago. Nobody had ever used it. And only one or two had ever actually heard of it. And the lender had never seen it as well. But <laughs> this is a really great thing for all those problems that people run into when you've got a home that has solar, this residential green and energy efficient addendum can be completed by the solar installer, uh, a builder of its new home, even by the homeowner if you have that data. And what this does is it gives an official way for someone to document, hey, this house has a, a 7 kW system. It was installed in this year. It has this kind of inverter. The production of this level has been guaranteed. And this energy efficient building addendum, addendum anybody can use it. It's available from the Appraisal Institute. And the whole idea is to convey these green building and energy efficiency features that might otherwise not be accounted for. And that's the big worry, right? That somebody puts in a solar system, they go to sell their home and the appraiser doesn't value that. 
So once you gather all that information, put it in the addendum, you can then use it multiple places. You can pull that detail and put it in your MLS listing. You can upload the complete addendum. You can mention in the property description. You can, there's those MLS fields. For example, in RE Colorado, we have fields for solar PV, system size, production kilowatt hours. You can enter all of that information right there. And then the homeowner, they have rights. This energy efficient building addendum is the homeowner's bill of right. The, the agent can send this letter over to the lender once you have an offer saying, hey, this home right here is special. We're including the energy efficient building addendum. And according to the regulations by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, it, this requires lenders to choose a competent appraiser who has this prerequisite knowledge. And as a home with solar, you need to choose an appraiser who knows how to accurately assess this. Because an appraiser that puts a zero in a field, that should have as much documentation behind it as putting a number. And when you have someone who doesn't really understand it, they can just blow right by that and give no value whatsoever. And so the way this works is the agent sends out addendum to the lender, um, also to the title company. The lender requests a qualified appraiser and the appraiser reviews that addendum in making that appraisal. So moving on to tip number nine, now we're talking about buyers. You can see that most of that stuff that we talked about, like understanding the contracts, all of that, and gathering that kind of information, all of that is really going to be relevant for your buyers too. But how does a buyer even find you if you're a real estate agent and you are sustainably minded, you are solar friendly, you can get your green designation like I did with the National Association of Realtors. There's other certifications out there, Pearl certification. You can host educational workshops for Earth Day or anytime really and get a solar partner and weave that sustainability theme through all of your marketing, your social media, your website. Your charitable partners, think about people who are doing this, all of this energy efficiency, solar that you can be associated with. All right, so now if you've got a buyer and they want to find a home that already has solar, then when you set up your search, you can search for those MLS fields. If you're in a board that doesn't yet have those specific green fields, you can set up a committee and get those fields added a friend just did that in Grand Junction. It didn't take long. If you're seeing those are missing, then you are able to do that. Maybe somebody says, okay, I don't need the home to have solar yet, but after I get it, I'm definitely going to want to go solar. One of the things that you can do is help your buyer start to understand what does that roof look like? What does a good roof look like? And we'll talk about that, but also ask your solar partner to help you with this. There's a tool called Google Project Sunroof. Not everywhere is mapped, but a lot of the metro areas are. So you can put the address in and see, is there gold on your roof? When you look at a neighborhood, you can see that some of these have more of this gold than others. Like this one right here has a lot of shading, the shape of the roof. You really only can maybe put panels here. A more simple, Roof shape allows for more panels. So if you've got unshaded east, west, south facing roof area, then that could work pretty well for solar. Another thing to understand is that there's some areas of the country where the rules around net metering, and that means how much the electric company will pay you for your excess solar that you send. In some places that net metering is less generous than it is in other countries. This map that I'm showing you right now, this is where Power, who I'm a consultant with, these are all the states that we're in. We are expanding, but you can see that some of the states here are already great for solar. And if somebody's thinking of a couple different locations, there might be one electric utility, like in Fort Collins, you could be in the city of Fort Collins or right outside in Excel. 
And that could impact how viable your solar system is. So if you have somebody that's a big deal, they want to go net zero, they want to have solar, then definitely check with your solar partner and we can help you sort through that. All right, so again, on the buyer side, you want to inform your team, your assistants, your agents, the lender, the title company, your solar partner, your homeowner's insurance company, because if it's already got a solar system on there, then you're gonna to want to make sure that is covered in your homeowner's insurance. Let's say a buyer says, I love this house, but I hate solar. That would be a good time to talk with them and see what is it that they're really thinking. And maybe they just don't understand what the value is, or maybe that solar system isn't that great. Really going at it with a consultative approach where you're able to get those details to see, are there benefits of solar in this home? And also giving them the proper expectations. Hey, if it's solar, it might take us a little bit more for our due diligence. We want to review these contracts. We want to know if it's a good deal or not. And the solar expertise. Yeah, definitely reach out to your solar partner. Again, if your buyer is looking at something, you can't really tell. The listing agent didn't gather all this detail that we're suggesting that you do. Then you could decide to have a solar inspection to get somebody out there to really check into it and give you an assessment of how it's working. So that same thing, asking your listing agent for all that great stuff. And tip number 10 is that solar for real estate, this is a leadership opportunity. This is a way for you to establish your niche with solar. There is a gap on one of the trainings that I saw a couple of weeks ago. There is a lady, she works at a nonprofit in Chicago. And she said, I don't know how many times I've had homeowners with solar tell me that when they went to sell their house, the real estate agent said, you should probably just take those off, take your panels off, <laughs> or you're not going to get any value from that. Here's somebody that really thought about it, that worked at it. And to have somebody be that dismissive of something that's so great for the planet, it just shows that there aren't a lot of solar friendly real estate agents out there or or if they are, maybe they're a little too hard to find. There is a gap and you could fill it. You could establish your reputation as a solar friendly agent. You could establish your legacy. One of the biggest companies out there, I think it's called Interface. They created this very cool carpet system that's tiles. So it used to be that people would carpet the entire office. And then every couple of years, they just pick everything up and do it again. And sitting at breakfast with his 13 year old daughter, she said, dad, that seems very wasteful. Can't you think of something better? Certainly other people had told him like, you should do something better, but it was his daughter, his wanting to be a good father, wanting to have that legacy that I'm responsible with the resources that are being left to your generation. So you can do the same thing. You can establish that legacy. We had a lot of the realtors as part of the EXP Climate Action Network. That's why they said they joined is that they have teenage kids, high school kids that are really concerned about climate change and that adults aren't taking them seriously. So this is a way for you to establish your credibility, your legacy by doing that. You don't have to go it alone. You can have your solar partner help you you can get referral revenue, or you can actually add solar to your portfolio. And you won't really be breaking the mold. I just saw this last month on Instagram, this Waypoint Brokers. They decided every single one of their realtors are going to be green designees, and that is going to be their brand. What a cool future. This is the future, which is exactly what they say right there. This is the future. We're thrilled to be at the forefront. So you can either be at the back, kind of like slogging your way through it, or you can be those ones that are out front. This, our ambassador program that we have is free to join. We have $1,000 referral commissions. And I know we're getting to the end here. So I just want to play one quick video. This is with Marisa Fletcher, because I think a lot of people are wondering, if I did solar, would it detract from my business? 
husband and I have been a husband and wife real estate team for the past 20 years. We owned a big box brokerage for 10 years, and at that brokerage, we trained agents on how to help their buyers and sellers with their real estate needs. Throughout our career, we've always placed within the top 5% in the real estate industry for our area. Real estate is not just something that we do. We breathe it, we live it. It's our focus, it's our passion. We get up every day looking forward to what we can do. So about 10 years ago, solar became really popular in real estate. And there were some really aggressive door knockers that were selling our clients these really bad deals. No one ever explained it properly and there just wasn't a trustworthy solar rep to be found. I was there. I was the one at the closing table with them. I saw them losing equity. I saw them losing assets. I saw them confused as to why they didn't get what they were promised when they signed that original solar contract. I saw the opportunity. I even have solar on my own house. I just didn't know how to help clients go about getting solar the right way. That's when I was introduced to power. About three years ago, another realtor that I know and respect in the industry, he said, Marisa, you need to get involved with this platform. So he gave me an introduction to Jonathan Bernasso, who gave me a tour of the platform and shared some key concepts of solar, like the difference between ownership and leasing a system, and how homeowners could reap the benefits that solar has to offer. Finally, a solar professional who cares about the welfare of homeowners. So in the beginning, I was worried that my business would take a hit, that solar would take away from the core principles of what I needed to do for real estate. Most of all, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to fit it into my busy schedule. I'm a nerd. I like to get deep into the things that I do. I don't want to do anything superficially. But it turns out that this was the best decision that we could have ever made. Right when I joined the platform, I was able to leverage Power's Tier 3 closers. And I was able to refer my clients and earn income. And within the first two months, I was driving my brand new Tesla. With the Power platform, I can Google the house, place the panels on the house, and design a proposal quickly within a few minutes. What I really love about the platform is that I can present remotely or in person, which gives me the option of working from home and not having to spend hours upon hours of drive time in my car. And if my clients have a question, there's a knowledge base and a training section on the platform that we can refer to. It's great. The way the platform is built, I can help my clients with their real estate needs and help them with their solar needs, creating a benefit for all parties. It's a win-win. Once I joined Power and realized that solar could be done right, I went all in as a solar advocate. It's a value add for your business. It's a value add for your clients because your clients are gonna go solar with or without you. And as their trusted realtor and advisor, what better way than to help these clients with this investment? That's the beauty of the solar business. We can keep being successful in real estate with a huge value add because most of our work is virtual. I don't even have to door knock. All I need to do is build relationships, take advantage of the incredible power learning programs and share my passion for solar. It worked for me and it could work for you too. My name is Marisa Fletcher and I'm living a powered life. And she is amazing. All right. Yeah, just summarizing the top 10 tips. So now is the time to befriend solar. It's not going away. Your clients are going solar with or without you for a lot of good reasons. Getting off fossil fuels is vital for our livable future. Know how to decipher those solar contracts. Assemble your team. Let everybody know they're solar. Don't keep that a secret till the end. <laughs> Gather that documentation early. Share it widely get an accurate appraisal using the energy efficient building addendum, help your buyers find a great solar home, establish your niche with solar. And the bonus tip is that if you have a solar partner like me or any one of our solar, our power solar consultants, then they can help you with all of these. So just wrapping up, I'm just starting these training series. And so I'd love to get any feedback on what other information you're looking for, and you're welcome to join in future sessions, come back again, bring others with you, and you can find all of that on the solarsavvyre.com. All right, and that is it. So thanks everybody for joining me.
thank you for taking your time to think about our planet and all the things that we can do to make it better and to care for it together. So thank you for being here today.